Part One of Nor Iron Bars a Cage by Randall Garrett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Nor Iron Bars a Cage by Randall Garrett. Part One. Her red blonde hair was stained and discolored when they found her in the sewer, and her lungs were choked with muck because her killer hadn't bothered to see whether she was really dead when he dumped her body into the manhole, so she had breathed the stuff in with her last gasping breaths. Her face was bruised, covered with great blotches, and three of her ribs had been broken, her thighs and abdomen had been bruised and lacerated. If she had lived for three more days, Angela Frances Donahue would have reached her seventh birthday. I didn't see her until she was brought to the morgue. My phone chimed, and when I thumbed it on, the face of Inspector Cleek, of Homicide South, came on the screen. His heavy eyelids always hang at half-mast, giving him a sleepy, bored look, and the rest of his fleshy face sags in the same general pattern. Roy. He said as soon as he could see my face on his own screen. We just found the little Donahue girl. The meat wagon's taking her down to the morgue now. You want to come down here and look over the scene, or do you want to go to the morgue? It looks like it's one of your special cases, and we won't know for sure until Doc Prouty does the post on her. I took a firm grip on my temper. I should have been notified as soon as homicide had been. I should have been there with the Homicide Squad, but I knew that if I said anything, Cleek would just say, Hell, Roy, they don't notify me until their suspicion of homicide, and you don't get a call until their suspicion that it might be the work of a degenerate. That's the way the system works, you know that, Roy. And rather than hear that song and dance again, I gave myself thirty seconds to think. I'll meet you at the morgue, I said. Your men can get the whole story at the scene without my help. That mollified him, and it showed a little on his face. Okay, Roy, see you there. And he cut off. I punched savagely at the numbered buttons on the phone to get an intercommunication hookup with Dr. Barton Brownlee's office on the third floor of the same building as my own office. His face, when it came on, was a calming contrast to Cleek's. He's nearly ten years younger than I am, not yet thirty-five, and his handsome, thoughtful face and dark, slightly wavy hair always makes me think of somebody like St. Edward Pusey or maybe Albert Einstein. Not that he looks like either one of them, or even that he looks saintly, but he does look like a man who has the courage of his convictions and is calmly, quietly, but forcefully ready to shove what he knows to be the truth down everybody else's throat if that becomes necessary. Or maybe I am just reading into his face what I know to be true about the man himself. Brownie, I said, they've found the Donahue girl, taken her down to the morgue now. Want to come along? I don't think so, he said without hesitation. I'll get all the information I need from the photos and the reports. The man I do want to see is the killer. I need more data, Roy, always more data. The more my boys and I know about these zanies, the more effectively we can deal with them. I know. Okay, I've got to run. I cut off and grabbed my hat and headed out to fulfill my part of the bargain Brownlee and I had once made. You find em, he once said, and I'll fix em. So far, that bargain had paid off. I got to the morgue a few minutes after the body was brought in. The man at the front desk looked up at me as I walked in and gave me a bored smile. Evening, Inspector. The Donahue kid's in the cleanup room. Then he went back to his paperwork. The lab technicians were standing around watching while the morgue attendant sluiced the muck off the corpse with a hose watching to see if anything showed up in the gooey filth. Inspector Cleek stood to one side. All he said was, Hi, Roy. The morgue attendant lifted up one small arm with a gloved hand and played the hose over the thin biceps. Good thing the rigor mortis has gone off, he said. These stiffs are hell to handle when they're stiff. It was an old joke, but everybody grinned out of habit. 
clear water from the hose flowed over the skin and turned a grayish-brown as it ran down to the bottom of the shallow waist-high stainless steel trough in which the body was lying. One of the lab techs stepped over and began going through the long hair very carefully, and Doc Prouty, the medical examiner, began cleaning out the mouth and nose and eyes and ears with careful hands. I turned to Cleek. You sure it's the Donahue girl? He sighed and looked away from the small, dead thing on the cleaning table. Who else could it be? She was found only three blocks from the Donahue home. No other female child reported missing in that area. We haven't checked the prints yet, but you can bet they'll tally with her school record. I had to agree. Uh, what about the time of death? Doc Prouty figures forty-eight to sixty hours ago. I'll be able to give you a better figure after the post, the medical examiner said without looking up from his work. A tall, big-nosed man in plain clothes suddenly turned away from the scene on the table, his mouth moving queerly, his eyes hard. After a moment his lips relaxed. Still staring at the wall, he said, I guess the case is out of federal jurisdiction, then. We'll cooperate, as usual, of course. He looked at me. Could I talk to you outside, Inspector Royal? I looked at Cleek. Okay, Sam? I didn't have to have his okay. It was just professional courtesy. He knew I'd tell him whatever it was that the FBI man had to say, and we both knew why the Federal agent wanted to leave. Sam Cleek nodded. Sure, I'll keep an eye out here. The FBI man followed me into the outer room. Do you figure this is a sex degenerate case, Inspector? he asked. Looks like it. You saw the bruises. Dr. Prouty will be able to tell us for sure after the post-mortem. He shook his head as if to clear it of a bad memory. You New York police can sure be cold-blooded at times. The thing that was bothering him, as Cleek and I both knew, was that the FBI agent hadn't been exposed to this sort of thing often enough. They deal with the kind of crimes that actually don't involve the callous murder of children very often. Even the murder of adults doesn't normally come under the aegis of the FBI. We're not cold-blooded, I said. Not by inclination, I mean, but a man gets that way. He has to get that way, after he's seen enough of this sort of thing. You either get yourself an emotional callous, or you get deathly sick from the repetition, and then you have to get out of the job. Yeah, he said, sure. He quit rubbing his chin with a knuckle, looked at me, and said, What I wanted to say is that there's no evidence that she was taken across the state line. Whoever sent that ransom note to the Donahue parents was trying to throw us off the track. Looks like it. Look at the timetable. The note was sent after the girl was murdered, but before the information hit the papers or the newscasts. The killer wanted us to think it was a ransom kidnapping. It isn't likely that the note was sent by a crank. A crank wouldn't have known the girl was missing at all at the time the note was sent. That's the way it seems to me, he agreed. The color was coming back into his face. But why would he want to make it look like a kidnapping instead of, of what it was? The penalty's the same for both. My grin had anger, pity, and disgust for the killer in it, plus a certain amount of satisfaction. Some day I'd like to see my face in a mirror when I feel like that. He was hoping the body wouldn't be found until it was too late for us to know that it was a rape killing. And that means that he knew he would be on our list if we did find out that it was rape. Otherwise he wouldn't have bothered. If I'm right, then he has outsmarted himself. He has told us that we know him, and he's told us that he's smart enough to figure out a dodge, that he's not one of the helpless stupid ones. That should help them narrow down the field, he said in a hard voice. He felt in his pocket for a cigarette, found his pack, took one out, and then held it unlit between the fingers of his right hand. Inspector Royal, I've studied the new law of this state, the one you're working under here, and I think it'll be great if it works out. I wish you luck. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to call the office. As he went out to the desk phone, I gave him a silent thanks. 
Words of encouragement were hard to come by at that time. I turned and went back toward the clean-up room. She didn't look as though she were asleep. They never do. She looked dead. She'd been head down in the sewer, and the blood had pooled and coagulated in her head and shoulders. Now that the filth had been washed off, the dark purple of the dead blood cells showed through the translucent skin. She would look better after she was embalmed. Doc Prouty was holding up a small syringe, eyeing the little bit of fluid within it. We've got him, he said in a flat voice. I'll have the lab run an analysis. We're well within the time limit. All we have to do is separate the girl's blood type from that of the spermatic fluid. You boys find your man, and I can identify him for you. He put the syringe in its special case. I'll let you know the exact cause of death in a couple of hours. Okay, Doc, thanks, said Inspector Cleek, closing his notebook. He turned to one of the other men. Thompson, you notify the parents. Get them down here to make a positive identification, and send it along to my office with the print identification. Then he looked at me. Anything extra you want, Roy? I shook my head. Nope. Let's go check the files, huh? Sure. Can I ride with you? I rode in with Thompson. He'll have to stay. Come along, I told him. By 10.15 that evening we had narrowed the field down considerably. We fed all the data we had into the computer, including the general type number of the spermatic fluid which Dr. Prouty had given us, and watched while the machine sorted through the characteristics of all the known criminals in its memory. Cleek and I were sitting at a desk drinking hot black coffee when the computer technician came over and handed Cleek the results at 10.15. Quite a bunch of them, Inspector he said. But the geographic compartmentalization will help. Cleek glanced over the neatly printed sheaf of papers that the computer had turned out, then handed them to me. There we are, Roy. One of those zanies is our boy. I looked at the list. Every person on it was either a confirmed or suspected psychopath, and each one of them conformed to the set of specifications we had fed the computer. They were listed in four different groups according to the distance they lived from the scene of the crime, half a mile, two miles, five miles, and remainder, the rest of the city. All we got to do, Cleek said complacently, is start rounding them up. You make it sound easy, I said tightly. He put down his coffee cup. Hell, Roy, it is easy. We've got all these characters down on the books, don't we? We know what they are, don't we? Look at them. Once in a while a new one pops up and we put him on the list. Once in a while we catch one and send him up. Practically cut and dried, isn't it? Sure, I said. Look, Roy, he went on, we got it down to a fine art now, have for years. He waved in the general direction of the computer. We got the advantage that it's easier to sort them out now and faster, but the old tried-and-true technique is just the same. Cops have been catching these goons in every civilized country on earth for a hundred years by this technique. Sam, I said wearily, are you going to give me a lecture on police methods? He picked up his cup, held it for a moment, then set it down again, his eyes hardening. Yes, Roy, I am. I'm older than you are. I've got more years on the force. I've been working with Homicide longer, and I outrank you in grade by two and a half years. Yes. I figure it's about time I lectured you. You want to listen? I looked at him. Cleek is a good cop, I was thinking, and he deserves to be listened to even if I don't agree with him. Okay, Sam, I said. I'll listen. Okay, then. He took a breath. Now, we got a system here that works. The nuts always show themselves up one way or another. Most of them have been arrested by the time they're fourteen, fifteen years old. Maybe we can't nail them down and pin anything on them, but we got them down on the books. We know they have to be watched. We got ninety percent of the queers and hotheads and stew bums and firebugs and the rest of the zanies down on our books. He waved toward the computer again and down in the memory bank of the computer. We know we're going to get them eventually, because we know they're going to goof up eventually, and then we'll have them. We'll have them. He made a clutching gesture with his right hand, right where it hurts. 
You take this Donahue killer. We know where he is. We can be pretty sure we got him down on the books. He tapped the sheaf of papers from the computer with a firm forefinger. We can be pretty be sure that he's one of these guys right down there. He waved his hand again, but this time he took in the whole city, the whole outside world. Like clockwork, the minute they goof, we nab em. Sam, I said, just listen to me for a minute. We know that ninety percent of the men on that list right there are going to be convicted of a crime of violence inside the next five years, right? That's what I've been telling you. The minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, just listen. Why don't we go out and arrest them all right now? Look at all the trouble that will save us. Hell, Roy, you can't arrest a man unless he's done something. What would you charge him with? Loitering with intent to commit a nuisance? No, but we can. I was cut off by a uniform cop who stuck his head in the door and said, Inspector Royal, Dr. Brownlee called. Says they picked up a hammerlock smith. He's at the 87th precinct. Wants you to come down right away if you can. I stood up and grabbed my hat. Sam, you can sit on this one for a while, huh? I've been waiting for hammerlock smith to fall for two months. Sam Cleek looked disgusted. And you'll see that he gets psycho treatment and a suspended sentence. A few days in the loony ward, and then right back out on the street. Hammerlock Smith. There's a case for you. Built like a gorilla, and has a passion for Irish whiskey and sixteen-year-old boys. And you think you can cure him in three days? Nuts. I didn't feel like arguing with him. We might as well let him go now as lock him up for three or four months and then let him go, Sam. Why fool around with assault and battery charges when we can wait for him to murder somebody and then lock him up for good, eh, Sam? What's another victim, more or less, as long as we get the killer? That's what we're here for, he said stolidly, to get killers. He scratched at his balding head. I don't get you, Roy. I think you'd want these maniacs put away after your— he stopped himself, wet his lips, and said, Okay, you go ahead and take care of Smith. Get some sleep. I'm going to. I leave orders to call us both if anything breaks in the Donahue case. I just nodded and walked out. I didn't want to hear any more. But the door didn't close tightly, and I heard Cleek's voice as he spoke to the computer tech. I just don't figure Roy. His wife died in a fire set by an arson bug, and he wants to— I kept on walking as the door clicked shut. End of Part 1